Thank you for joining us for our online service here at Hope Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. We are honored that you are tuning in, and we believe that God is going to use this service in your life and the lives of many others in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. We believe that a Jesus follower abides in Christ, connects in community, and shares in the mission. If you're watching this, we would love to connect with you. If you'd like to find out more about who we are, please visit hopechurchonline.com. Once again, thank you for worshiping online with us today. We hope you enjoy the service. Hi, Hope Church. My name is Ron Ray, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch our online worship service today. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Thank you for spending the next hour with us. Do us a favor and text new to hope to 94090. After you hit send, you'll get an immediate response from our team with a link to a short form for you to fill out so we can get to know you better. Have you downloaded the Hope Church LV app? If not, text Hope Church LV to 77977 and we'll send you a download link. On our app, you can stay up to date with everything going on at Hope. Watch or rewatch previous worship services, request prayer, take notes during today's sermon, and more. Make sure to download today. Before Hope Creative leads us in worship, there are two things we want you to know about. Number one, have you started the Proverbs Challenge? If not, visit hopechurchonline.com slash proverbs and start today. Two, Father's Day is right around the corner. To celebrate all the dads in our church, we're having a tailgate and drive-in movie night on Friday, June 19th. Bring your own food and grill and watch a movie with us. The tailgate will be starting at 6.30 p.m. and the movie starts at 8 p.m. Our worship team, Hope Creative, is about to lead us in worship. But before they do, let's prepare our hearts by reading Psalm 145.3. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Welcome to Church Online. So glad you've joined us. We're going to sing right now, so wherever you are, we encourage you to worship and join in with us as we sing to God.
reality of what we just sang is true. God has the power to bring new life. And every time we gather as a church family, whether it's online or in person, our desire is to worship the one who has brought us out of spiritual darkness and into his marvelous light. We believe one of the most significant things we do as a church is seek God together in worship. We are called to worship. We need to worship. And I hope that during today's service, you will worship the living God. Right now, I wanna lead us in a few moments to do just that. First of all, we are going to worship God by honoring him with the financial resources he has given us. God is our provider and we are to honor him with everything he provides for us. One way we do that with our finances is by giving regularly, proportionally, and sometimes sacrificially through the church as an investment in God's kingdom. Each week as a part of our service, we worship God in that way. If you've not already, I wanna encourage you to be a part of fueling the mission of God by joyfully giving through Hope Church. There are multiple ways you can give today and you can see several of those ways on the screen. Another way we are going to express our worship to God today is by praying together. We value engaging in scripture-fed, spirit-led moments of prayer because we know when we seek God in prayer, we experience Him in power. I love what the psalmist cried out to the Lord in Psalm 123, verse one, when he said, "'To you I lift up my eyes, "'O you who are enthroned in the heavens.'" I know one of the most challenging aspects in a service like this is being able to shift our attention away from all that is taking place around us to set our focus on the Lord. So today I want us to ask God to give us the grace to lift up our eyes to Him. I know with all that is taking place in our city, our nation and around the world, there are a lot of things that may be on your heart. You may be hurting, you may be confused, you may be frustrated, you may be exhausted. Regardless of where you find yourself today, I wanna pray Psalm 123.1 over your life, that the Lord would lift up your eyes to Him during this service. So I wanna invite you now, wherever you are, to join me in a few moments to pray. God, right now, we lift up our eyes to you. God, in this service, in this moment, we look to you. We look to you as the one who is good, who is faithful, who is in control, who is patient, who is eternal, and who is active. And Lord, we invite you to give us grace that we may set our focus on you right now and lift up our eyes. Lord, we need to do that as individuals. Lord, I pray that wherever this service is being viewed, that you would meet people right where they are as they worship you in living rooms, in kitchens, at places of business, in backyards. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm us today with your presence as individuals. But Lord, we also look to you as a society. Lord, our society needs healing. God, we need wisdom. We need reconciliation. We need justice. God, we need grace. And so, Lord, in every way possible in this moment, Lord, we look to you as our hope, as our life, and as our God. And Lord, we pray now as we continue in this service, Lord, would you draw us to yourself as we sing together, as we look at your word, as we respond to what you speak into our lives. Lord, I pray that today we would worship. Thank you for the opportunity to seek your heart today. We pray you'd speak to us in Jesus' name, amen.
desire or ask for we find in you and so in the midst of a pandemic in the midst of racial tension in the midst of our world being in chaos and our lives seemingly in confusion we will lift our hearts we will lift our voice we will lift our praise to the one true and living God because we know that you are in control you are sovereign you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think and so we celebrate you we give you glory we honor you we bless you we shout hallelujah regardless of what we feel regardless of what we may be walking through you are still good you are still God and we will still give you the glory that you deserve so we sing to you we cry out to you we say this Lord. Mm -hmm. You're everything to me. Can you tell me one more time? You're everything to me. Say, you're everything to me. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Last weekend, we began together a journey through one of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Proverbs. I told you last weekend that there's not another book in the Bible that has more significantly impacted my life on a day in and day out basis than the book of Proverbs. Obviously, I love all of God's word and God has used all of his word in shaping me into the man that he's created me to be. But when I think about the books of the Bible, there is not a single book of the Bible that has more impacted my life daily 
than the book of Proverbs. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this series that we're walking through over a couple of months together because my prayer is that as you get exposed by the, the Holy Spirit of God to the truth and the wisdom of Proverbs, that this becomes a practice in your life for the rest of your life of daily reading the proverb that corresponds to the day of the month. And as I was doing that this past week, we read uh, through the Proverbs this week together as a church family. As I was doing that personally, I'm reading Proverbs like I always do, asking God to speak into my life. But now I have a little bit of an ulterior motive. I'm like, Lord, what, what do you want to say to your people? Out of this week of reading in Proverbs, God, where is it that you want us to land as a family of faith and dig deep? And I think there's added pressure today as a pastor in light of the circumstances that we're living in in the world, whether it's the racial tension and uh, the upheaval that's taking place right now in that arena, or it's the, 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 the physical pandemic of the COVID-19 crisis, or it's the economic impact of all of those factors and what's happening in society, or it's the global nature of what's taking place. There's an extra burden on my heart as we read through Proverbs to try to bring wisdom out of the book of Proverbs that speaks right to where we're living today as followers of Jesus, trying to be ambassadors for his kingdom in the midst of what's taking place. And so this week, as I was reading through Proverbs, I just asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want to say to your people? And before I'd even read this word in Proverbs, the Holy Spirit of God, just in my time alone with him, kind of whispered into my soul. And I don't want to make that sound more mystical than it is. I'm not saying that God speaks to me audibly. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But just that still, small whisper of the Holy Spirit, the word hope just came to my mind. I don't know about where you've been living, but I need some hope. Over the last few weeks, you've heard me. I've been very transparent both in Sunday services and in Wednesdays in the Word, the devotion that I lead on Wednesday mornings. And, and you've heard me be real vulnerable about just the emotional upheaval that, that I've walked through, trying to navigate this as a Christian, but also trying to lead a multicultural fellowship, a fellowship representative of 54 different language groups, trying to navigate these very challenging and complex waters had left me at a place of a little bit of despondency in my own heart. And as the Holy Spirit whispered that into my heart, hope, I thought, man, that's what I need to hear. I need to hear hope. And then I thought, you know, it's not just what I need to hear. It's what we need to hear. I think we can get in the midst of situations like we're in right now, and we can be overwhelmed with a sense of hopelessness. But as followers of Jesus, we have hope. And not just us, I think it's what the world needs to hear today. The world needs to hear a message of hope. Because of my reading this this week and kind of walking with this before the Lord, I actually sat down on my computer, my laptop, and I Googled the word hopeless just to see what would come up. And there were four, many articles, but I pulled four of them. Let me show you four articles that appeared just this past week in headlines across America. Here's one. It appeared on June the 4th in usafacts.org. It says 45% of Americans are feeling down, depressed, or hopeless during the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's another one. It's on CNN. They put this out. Feeling hopeless after a tough week? Here are five things that may help. Here's another one out of an HR online resource. Here's the title of the article, Burnout, Hopeless, Drained. Mental health concerns are prevalent during COVID-19. Here's one, right? and again, all of these are from this week's headlines. Here's one from fortune.com. A mental health crisis is unfolding in the workplace. COVID-19 and racial injustice are to blame. 
just a quick scanning of the headlines over the past week or so, and we understand that the headlines are screaming, we need hope. What is hope? I looked it up in a dictionary. Webster's Dictionary is kind of my go-to. I have to look up words at times just to really grasp the meaning of the word. In Webster's Dictionary, they define hope as a desire with expectation of fulfillment. Here's another definition. To expect with confidence. And many people, specifically in American culture, we hear the word hope and we hear those definitions of this expectation with fulfillment and we think about hope more like a wish. Well, I hope I win the lottery or I hope I get a new car. Almost like we would use that word synonymously with the word wish. But I want you to understand for the Christian, hope is something so much more than a wish. Let me give you a definition of or a defining statement about hope. Hope for the Christian is confident expectation based on the character and promises of God. Today, we may be living in a situation that appears hopeless, but here's what I want you to know. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you and I can have hope. And that hope is not rooted in our circumstances. That hope is not found in society or in culture. That hope is based on the character and the promises of God. Here's what that means. Our hope rests in who our God is, and our hope rests in what our God has said. We can have hope. Let me give you one example of this from Scripture. It's a great verse about hope out of Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Listen to what it says. It's God speaking. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. You know what that tells us? That tells us something about who he is. I know the plans that I have. That speaks to his sovereignty. It speaks to his omnipotence. God is in control. We said it a few weeks ago. He is large and he is in charge. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Then look what it said. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a, wherever you're watching this online, say it with me out loud, to give you a future and a hope. Hope. What a beautiful word. God said, I know the plans that I've got for you. And the plans that I've got for you are plans that ought to fill you with hope. Now, some would say, yeah, but that's an Old Testament verse of Scripture. That's a promise made to the children of Israel. That's true. But many of the promises from the Old Testament, the Scripture in the New Testament says, are also applicable to us as Christians. You see, this promise was made to the children of Israel while they were exiles in Babylon. An exile is someone who's forced to live in another country or land that is not their home. For, for, for centuries, they were in Babylon. They were in Babylonian captivity. The Israelites, the children of God, were exiled. They were forced to live in a land that was not their own. But God said, I've got a promise for you. I've got a promise that there is a future for you. There is a land for you that is filled with hope. Let me tell you how that applies to us today. We're exiles. You see, as Christians, particularly Christians in America, if we're not careful, our Christianity can be so woven with our civic identity as Americans that we can forget we're living in a land that is not our home. Let me show it to you in the book of Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes and he says, for our citizenship ultimately is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the savior the lord jesus christ this world is not our home one of the reasons today we're frustrated one of the reasons we're angry one of the reasons that we're confused one of the reasons that we're discouraged is because we're looking at the world that we live in and the world that we live in is not the world that we long for in our hearts because God now lives inside of us and has birthed in us a desire for another kingdom. Let me give you good news today. Here's some good news. As believers, we can have hope that one day 
the world we long for will be the world we live in. All those righteous desires for a world that is right, that world that we long for, let me give you some hope. That's going to be the world we live in. It's coming. I know what you're thinking, Pastor. What does this have to do with Proverbs? You said we were studying through Proverbs. Well, I had all that I've just shared with you in my heart. I'm wrestling through all of that. And I came this week on Saturday to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Listen what it said. Hope deferred makes the heart sick but desire fulfilled is a tree of life i really want to zero in on this first phrase and everything i'm going to say has really been born if you're a regular part of the hope family you know normally we dig in a text of scripture and we just kind of unpack it today's going to be a little bit different we're going to take this phrase of scripture hope deferred makes the heart sick and we're going to kind of use that as a little bit of a springboard to unpack some of the hope that we have as followers of jesus but what the writer of proverbs here tells us is that hope deferred what does this word deferred mean In Hebrew, it's a word that means to drag or to pull out or to draw out or to prolong. It's the idea of it being postponed. It's right in front of you. And every time you get close, it just keeps moving a little further down the line. The writer of Proverbs says, when that happens to hope, here's what happens to your heart. It gets sick. It's a hurt that's born from sorrow let me tell you why a lot of us right now are struggling to find hope because we've set our hope on things that are not certain let me give it to you in a kind of a a statement that I wrote down in my notes even preparing to walk in here it says if your greatest hope rests in anything in this life your heart is always going to be sick and left unsatisfied. Let me remind you, this world's not our home. This world, this current world, will never be the world we long for. And if you've set your hope If you've set your confident expectation on the things of this world, satisfying the deepest longings of your heart, listen, it will never happen. You will always be heart sick and soul left unsatisfied. As Christians, if we put our hope in the things of this world, for example, if we put our hope in politicians and political parties, let me just tell you, we're always going to be sick. They're going to keep moving the ball down the field. Every time we get close, they continue to move the goalposts further away from us. If we put our hope there, and listen, when I say that, I know some of you hear that and think I'm talking about Republicans. Some of you hear that thing I'm talking about Democrats. Some of you hear that and think I'm talking about independents. Let me just say it this way. No political party, no political party in America owns a holistic gospel platform. Every one of them have weaknesses in their platform. It's why we as Christians must continue to be prophetic with our voice and we must continue to yearn for a world that's yet to come because this world will never satisfy us we put our hope in our country I think some people think that America they they read the Bible and they, they read it like America is somehow the promised land America is never referenced in scripture not one time now the people who live here obviously we're addressed in scripture but the Bible never speaks about the United States of America We've so interwoven our faith with our country at times that I think there's a little bit of syncretism that takes place in our Christianity where we think somehow God's favor and God's blessing is woven into the culture of who we are as Americans. If we put our hope in America, listen, we're going to always be heart sick. 
If you put your hope in the, 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 the economics of, of this, this country, if you put your hope in the opportunities of this country, even if you put your hope in the freedoms of this country, you're going to be left unsatisfied and disappointed. Oh, but let me tell you, there is a world that is to come. There is a kingdom that we get to see glimpses of today that one day we'll see in all its fullness. And that's where our hope needs to rest. When I read the book of Proverbs, the way I read the book of Proverbs is, is kind of unique. And I want to kind of explain that because I want to encourage you to establish this discipline in your own life. I read the book of Proverbs and I try to look for wisdom personified. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you were to look at my Bible, all through the book of Proverbs, all around the margins are little notes like this. Here's one on this page. It says, wisdom finds security and righteousness, not wisdom. Here's another one. Wisdom is never offended by correction. Here's another one. Wisdom understands righteous living to be a sure foundation in life. I'm always looking for what wisdom does, what wisdom sees, what wisdom pursues, what wisdom understands, what wisdom describes, how wisdom responds. As it applies to hope, this verse says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. What does that teach us about wisdom? Here it is. Wisdom hopes for that which is sure. And here's what I'm telling you. If you put your hope in anything in this world, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Listen, this world is unsure. This world is uncertain. But I'm telling you, the one that is to come is sure. So in the minutes that we have remaining, what I want to do is try to unpack for you some things that are sure about the world that is to come. I want to give you four of them. And I'm going to intentionally use the word hope and spell the word hope with these four things. Four things about the world that is to come that is sure, that you can set your hope on, and I can promise you, you will not be disappointed. Here's the first one. Hurts will all be healed. In the world that is, listen, I know right now we're living in a time when a lot of people are feeling hurt. And many are feeling hurt justifiably because of wrong or injustice or disease or economic impact. There's a lot of hurt right now that people are feeling. I'm talking to people and emailing with people regularly right now who are hurting. Listen, on days you need hope, let me encourage you to read the end of the book. At the end of the Bible in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, on days you need hope, Hey, just go read Revelation 21 and 22. Just spend a little time there as John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is allowed to see the world that's going to come, and John describes it in detail. In Revelation 22, and I'm going to spend some time here in Revelation 21 and 22 kind of unpacking some of this hope, but I want to start in Revelation 21 read the first four verses. Listen to what John said. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And that's a good place for all of us to say amen. I'm thankful that the world that we now live in is passing away and our God is making a new heaven and a new earth. Then look what he said. And there's no longer any sea. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Listen, that ought to inspire hope. Did you hear that? God will be with us physically in this place. But here's verse 4. I want you to focus on this verse. And he, that God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Some of you right now are crying tears that you think nobody sees. You think nobody hears. 
you think nobody notices. Here's what I'm telling you. Your Father in heaven sees. Your Father in heaven hears. You have his attention. And listen to what it says. In the new world, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Tony Evans writes about this verse of Scripture. I want you to listen to what Tony Evans said. I think he captured it masterfully. Here's what Tony Evans said about Revelation 21.4. All of the things that make life difficult will be wiped away in heaven. That ought to give you hope. The stuff that you're facing right now, regardless of what it is that's got you at this place of despair and despondency and hopelessness, here's what I want to tell you today. All of the things that bring sorrow and difficulty into this life, in the world that is to come, our God is going to wipe them all away. You see, in the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us that God created a world created human beings as the crowning point of that creation. And he placed us in this perfect environment called earth to enjoy fellowship with him. But humanity, human beings, Adam and Eve, chose to sin against God. And when we sinned against God, it brought a curse into this world. It's a curse that primarily brought about this thing called death. Death physically, death and our relationship with God, but it also brought brokenness into the world. This curse of sin has affected every area of our life in this world. Relationships, work, the environment, spirituality, fellowship with God. Everything was affected by this curse when we chose to sin against God. What the Bible here describes as mourning, crying, pain, those are all the results of the brokenness that has come into this world because of sin. Mourning is a word that means grief or suffering. Crying is a shouting out in grief. Pain is a labor that demands the whole strength of a human being. Some of you right now are living with mourning. You're living with crying and you're living with pain and grief. (laughs) Here's the promise. John says, in the world that is to come, All of that is gone. It's gone. All the hurts will be healed. He'll wipe away every tear. It literally means that he will remove every sorrow that goes with being a human being. How does that happen? Let me show it to you. Galatians chapter 3. It says that Christ redeemed us. From what? The curse of the law. What is that? It's the penalty, the consequence of our sin, the brokenness that came into the world because of humanity's sin against God. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What does that mean? On the cross, Jesus took all of the penalty of the curse of sin on himself, and he died on a cross for our sin. He bore the full blow of the wrath of God against sin on himself. He died in our place. But then he rose again from the dead as a testimony that God had accepted his sacrifice for our sin so that now you and I can put our faith and trust in Jesus and look forward to a glorious day when everything will be redeemed and restored to the world that God intended. All your hurts will be healed. Here's the second thing. Oppression will be over. Not only in this world to come, hurts will be healed, but oppression will be over. Oppression is something that we live with. It's it's a consequence of the brokenness of this world. You say, what is oppression? Oppression is a wielding of control from the outside. And it usually manifests itself in cruel, unjust treatment of others. Oppression is a sinful way of relating to other people that says, I am more important 
than you. Oppression manifests itself in many ways in our world today. First of all, there's physical oppression in the world. We've seen in recent years, the last two or three years, we've seen some societal movements rally against oppressive physical situations. The Me Too movement, the Church Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of those began as a societal response to the realities of oppression. Let me say a couple of things about this. As Christians, we should stand against oppression in any form. As Christians, we should stand against oppression, whether it's spousal abuse, child abuse, sexual abuse, bigotry, racism, classism, social injustice, xenophobia, wherever we see oppression as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be a voice, an advocate for the oppressed. You say, why would you say that? Well, let me give you two reasons. There are a lot more, but I'm going to give you two. Jesus demonstrated and expected care and compassion for the least of these in society. You can't read about, study, and understand the public ministry of Jesus without understanding he had a passion for the least of these. Whether it was an unclean leper, an outcast woman, a despised Samaritan, or an unwanted child. Jesus demonstrated care and compassion to the least of these through his earthly ministry. As followers of Jesus, we should use our voice for the vulnerable and the marginalized. We looked at it last weekend. It's right in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8 and 9. I'll read it to you again out of the New Living Translation. Listen to what wisdom says. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. We see it modeled in the life and ministry of Jesus, but also the New Testament teaches us that there is complete oneness in the body of Christ. Paul writes this profound statement in Galatians chapter 3, and we read it today and miss some of the significance because we don't understand all the, complex, the, the uh, cultural complexities that Paul was living in. But when Paul made this statement in his day, it was radical. Listen to what he said. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And for that reason, there is no place in Christianity for a demanding spirit of superiority that manifests itself in any way as oppression of others. Every form of racism bigotry and supremacy by one people or culture against another people or culture it's sin and I'll just add this it's time for the church of Jesus Christ in America to go from being not racist to being actively anti-racism as we seek to bring about holistic kingdom transformation in our city and our nation but there's not just physical oppression in the world there's spiritual oppression in the world that we live in. The reality is that we have an enemy, a very real spiritual enemy in this life, and he seeks to wield his control in this world in a cruel and unjust way. Ultimately, all physical oppression is ultimately the work of our enemy, wielding his spiritual power in this world. You say, Pastor, I thought you were going to talk to us about hope. Where's the hope in this? Here's the hope. In this life, listen, we will always have oppression. We're going to get glimpses. We'll get glimpses of the world that's to come, but we'll never see it in this life because what we're talking about are sin issues. And in this life, sin is not going away. But go back to Revelation 21. Down in verse 25, listen to what John writes when he's writing about heaven. He said, in the daytime, I love this parenthetical expression, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. You know what that speaks to? Darkness in Scripture and darkness oftentimes in 
storying narrative and in culture is associated with evil. It's associated with crime and wickedness done under the cover of night. In John's day, to be locked outside of the city gates after dark meant great danger. We live in a world today where the enemy that we have is wielding his spiritual power in forms of oppression all over the world. It's not unique to America. You drop down in any country on planet Earth, in any corner of the globe, and you will see the wickedness of oppression. I'm tired of seeing the effects of our oppressive enemy in the lives of people, whether it's addiction or divorce or abuse or terrorism or racism. But here's Here's what John said. Man, in the new world, there ain't no darkness there. It's been removed. John MacArthur summarized it. Listen to what he said. There will be no rival to the glory or authority of God. The cosmic conflict of the ages will be finally ended forever, and God and his people will dwell in utter security here's what i'm telling you we are headed to a world where forever oppression is over it's over number three peace will be present i'm just going to mention these last couple quickly but in our world today we don't have peace we have hatred war bloodshed death that's what filled our headlines, but not in the world to come. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament at one point spoke prophetically about the world that is to come. Listen to what he writes. I want you to hear the beauty in this language. He says, in that day, out of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, in that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. Listen. Wolves and lambs don't live together. I know most of you who watch me here in Las Vegas, you're predominantly city folk, never been out in the country, but I'm just telling you, wolves and lambs do not get along. But in the world that's to come, wolves and lambs live together. Listen to what he says. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And get this. A little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Peace will be present. Here's the last thing. Here's the E. Eternity will be every day. What I've described for you, it's not something we're going to have for a few days, few weeks, few months, or even one political cycle. Eternity is forever. Meaning, all that we've talked about, and listen, we've just scratched the surface. All that we've talked about will be every day of every week, of every month, of every year for eternity that's why in psalm 22 or excuse me in revelation 22 the second chapter of what i talked about today john says and they will reign forever and ever you see it we can have hope as christians we hope for that which is sure let me tell you what's sure in the world is to come all the hurts are going to be healed all oppression is going to be over peace is going to be present and eternity is going to be forever it's going to be forever So here's where I want to leave you. As believers, we can have hope that one day the world we long for will be the world we live in. 
forever. What did wisdom say? Wisdom puts its hope in that which is sure. If you put your hope, if ultimately your hope rests in the things of this world, you will live heart sick and soul unsatisfied. But if you put your hope in that which is sure, you'll never be disappointed. Maybe you're watching this and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not a Christian. I don't know Jesus. I've maybe never even been to your church. But I sure like what you're talking about. How can I have that hope? Here's the good news of the whole story of this book. The whole story of this book is a story of God's love for you. He loves you so much that even though you and I sinned against him, he didn't leave us in our sin. He sent his son Jesus into the world. And as I talked about earlier, Jesus took all of your sin and my sin on a cross on himself and he died for our sin. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And in the Gospel of John, he made this powerful statement. He sums up the whole narrative of the Bible in one sentence. Jesus said, For God so loved the world. That means you and me. That he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but can have eternal life right where you are today. I want to invite you, if you want this hope, if you want Jesus in your life, to just pray right there with me. You can bow your head, you can say it out loud, or you can just say it in your heart. But just simply pray these words. And listen, as you do this, It's not the words of a prayer that brings salvation. It's faith in Jesus, faith in the gospel that saves. But you can do that by prayer. So just pray this. Say, say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you died for my sin. I know that you rose again from the dead. Right now, Jesus, I give my life to you. And I receive your life, your forgiveness. I turn from my sin. And I trust you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I want you to look back at me. Listen. If you just put your faith in Jesus, let me be the first to say to you, welcome to the family of God. And everything that I described today for you, listen, everything we describe and infinitely more, all is now yours. Listen, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did for you. I'm gonna ask you to do something. If you just prayed with me, and you just received Christ into your life, I want you to grab your smartphone right now. Just grab your smartphone, and I'm gonna ask you to text a number. I want you to text the number 94090. Just grab your cell phone, text 94090, and here's what I want you to text. The words, Jesus follower. You text Jesus follower to 94090. If you just prayed with me, or if you'd like to talk to somebody about how you can have this hope, Just text 94090, the word Jesus follower, and we'll immediately respond to you and give you a way where we can connect to have the conversation. If you've already received Christ today, we want to walk with you on this new journey. Maybe you're already a Christian and you're just struggling with one of the many things going on in the world right now and you just need prayer. You can text that same number, 94090, and just text the words, pray for me. We'll send you a link where you can inform us. And we want to pray this week for you by name. We want to intercede for you. Let me do it. 
right now. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for speaking. God, I pray today, I pray that supernaturally today people have hope. For believers that they understand the hope that they have is sure. For unbelievers that they would find hope in Jesus today. God, may we be ambassadors in this world. May we allow there to be glimpses of the glory of the world that is to come manifested in this world through our very lives. And we pray with the New Testament authors, Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
watching our service today. If you ask Jesus into your life, text Jesus follower to 94090. If you have a prayer request, we'd be honored to pray for you. Text pray for me to 94090. We miss and love you, Hope Church family. Have a great week.